Now, inflation that you see on the news, for instance, was 2.99% yesterday, isn't reflective of, that's the CPI. We're not buying a lot of those things that are calculated in CPI, so we use the MPI. We can't compare Toronto taxes to, to Ajax or Durham taxes, it just will never work. They also receive enormous amounts of subsidies from the province and the federal government that the rest of us just do not get. I think I explained that. We are 7.59% of 32.5%, which is 2.47. So that was what the tax increase was. Why we did? Because that's what it cost to run the town. We're just going to get started here right at 7 o'clock. Um, so first of all, thank you for coming out tonight. I'm just going to do a couple of housekeeping and reminders before we get started here. Uh, so tonight, Mayor Collier is going to be going through a brief presentation. Followed by that, we'll have an open forum Q&A session. Uh, we did get a few questions in advance that Mayor Collier will address first. After that, um, if you would like to ask a question, please just raise your hand. Then I'll come to you. I'll bring you the mic so that everybody can hear you cl clearly. And um, we just ask if you could ask one question at a time. If you have multiple questions, hopefully we'll be able to come back to you, but we want to be able to give everybody a chance to ask a question, right? And um, with that, just a couple of reminders. Please be respectful and patient while you're waiting to ask your question. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Mayor Collier for the land acknowledgement. Thanks, Devin. I'm Mike, is that working? That's good, okay. Uh, thanks everyone for coming tonight. I mean, it's a nice night, it's sunny, it's the Thursday of a long weekend, so I'm glad we got the people we've got because I didn't know how many we were gonna get tonight. So I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to come and join us here and uh, hopefully educate me and hopefully I can educate you a little bit about some of the things that happen around the town of Ajax. I'll start off with the land acknowledgement. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that the land in which we gather is situated within the traditional and treaty territories of the Mississauga First Nation. Signatories of the Gunshot Treaty of 1788 and the Williams Treaties of 1923. This land is and will, and will continue to be home to the Indigenous peoples. Let us acknowledge the mistakes and traumas of the past through authenticity and support truth and reconciliation as we move forward with kindness and respect as a community. We do have a brief couple of PowerPoint slides just to go over a couple of things that are, are happening right now, like the strategic plan. We just had our strategic plan. Update. At the onset of each term of council, we get together and determine and set out with a strategic plan where we are, what the priority items are that we want to accomplish through the term of, of council and what we have to do to get there. And then each year we will have an update to see where we are, make sure we're on track, are the priorities still the same, should we modify the course in some way or another uh, in order to, to stay on track. So we did that in March 2023. And we approved, we called it Action 2026. And you may have seen that logo around town and on our website in a few different places. Um, it identified 13 council priorities and 176 supporting actions. Of those, 86 are complete or at least initiated. So we've gotten a little over the, well, we're almost right at the halfway point, halfway through the term, which is good. 46 are complete, 40 have been started and are ongoing, and 31 are yet to be started. Um, last term, during COVID, there was actually a number that we had to take out because we knew we weren't going to accomplish them during COVID and a bunch that we put in as well. So this is sort of a living, breathing document that we do modify as we go along. Some of the things that we've come out with now are pet waste, um, in-ground pet waste container systems to try and get that out of our, our mainstream of garbage in our parks, um, be a little more efficient there. Uh, the TOA Talks podcast, I don't know if you had a chance to see those yet. Right now we're doing all of our senior staff, CAO, and directors, and it will go on to councillors, I believe, at a later date. The new housing strategy and the business engagement strategy, how we can help our businesses, what we have to do to grow the town. We have done the library makerspace open last year. We expanded our senior snow removal program this year. Um, that was one of the things that we had heard very loud and clear from our seniors, senior residents, that they don't want to wait sometimes 48 hours for the roads to be cleared, and so we, we uh, augmented the system to make that happen in a shorter time frame. We've expanded our automatic speed enforcement. That was uh, the only thing that has really, really worked to, lo to slow speeds, and that works about 40% to reduce speeds in our community safety zones and school zones. And uh, there's many, many, many others that, that we've done throughout, but those are just some of the highlights. Next slide, please. Um, there's been actually just an interview about this this morning, uh, somebody from Park, one of the press was asking me about strong mayor powers. 
and other things. So one of the big changes this year was the, the new budget process under the strong mayor powers is the mayor's budget. And um, one of the misconceptions about this is that it's only my budget. It's not. I work with staff. We work through the whole thing. We bring it forward, present it to council. I also coordinate with all members and take their feedback. The health council is authorized to amendments. choose to do so. They did not choose to do so this time around. I met with them and some of the things they wanted added, I added. Some of the things we took away. And when the budget came to the floor, it was, well, we no longer go through a vote of support. It's more, is anybody against? Nobody vetoes, so therefore it is accepted. Um, I did my best to come out with a budget that's fair for the taxpayer. We have all the same challenges at the town of Ajax that all of you would receive with your daily uh, expenses with your houses, whether it become to you know fuel pricing or electricity pricing, insurances, food, all that. We have most of the same things here at the town. So when you're when you go to the gas station and gas has gone up 10 cents a liter overnight, ours goes up as well, and we have to sort of account for that. So it is a difficult bit of a balancing act. And this year's budget wasn't just a status quo, keep the lights on budget. This was actually um, has some growth items in there, some expansion of services. Um, the budget this year is going to be going to the public on December the 6th, and there will be a public budget meeting on December the 12th. We're not required to hold a public meeting, but like this year, on January 12th, we held a public meeting. I wanted it to be open and accountable and give the public the opportunity to come and speak and ask questions, so we are going to do that again. So why we're doing it early in December is because that allows us, we used to approve it February or March, and we're already a quarter way through the year by the time that happens. So when we're going out to tender on things like roads and construction projects and other things, it's better to be out early before people get busy and, and we tend to uh, be able to do things more efficiently. Next slide, please. Oh, this might come up. Uh, I is to take cycling off-road onto the multi-use path, and we are removing the section between Westney Dryer and Clover Ridge, and returning those to four lanes of road. It's for continuity. It's our new um, road, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Not layout, but our new, the way we do our roads going forward. If you go to Roslyn Road and look how we're doing it, it's got your four lanes, it's got the three meter trail on one side, sidewalk on the other side. It's our new standard that we do. So we're returning Lower Harwood to the standard so it's consistent. Next slide. And some of the things that are upcoming this weekend, of course, Canada Day, July 1st, Ajax Towns from 2 to 10 p.m. Uh, decided that next year, I think that, I'm not sure, but I think that may be held at our new fairground that's opening up just south of the Audley Rec Center. We have a large town-owned portion there. It's been many years in the works, and this summer the work is being done to create the fairground there to hold large outdoor events like Canada Day, Rib Fest, all these other different types of things. The lands around Ajax Downs and this area will eventually be developed in all likelihood, so we want to make sure we have that backup plan so we can still hold large events in Ajax. Uh, Summer in the Square is every Tuesday at Pat Bailey Square starting July 9th, so there'll be lots of different events there. Zoom in the Square, which I haven't been to, but that starts July 19th, August 9th, and September 13th at Pat Bailey Square. And our new cricket pitch opening. The cricket pitch has been several years in the works. We received some significant grant funding from that years ago. Um, the, the existing building was, I think, 50-ish years old and in very poor repair, so because of that grant funding, Cricket is one of our fastest growing sports. We have a very, very diverse community. 65% of Ajaxians um, are identifying as non-white, as diverse, as, um, I'll leave it at non-white. <laughs> I don't remember the term. Um, but uh, a large portion, really, cricket is really, really, really taking off. And so we need to address that. And there's a lot more information on ajax.ca at town events. And I think that's the last slide. Yep. So we do have some questions. Uh, I, I'll go to the questions first, and then we'll open up the floor. There were some pre-submitted ones, so I'll open up the floor after that. 
And as Devin said, please just reach out and she will um, come by with the microphone. There we go. So I actually, we had a resident do a delegation to council on Monday. I thought he might be here, but I'm sure this is where these questions came from. Um, what tangible benefits are the residents of Ajax receiving from the increase in property taxes? It was stated that the casino would help keep property taxes low, yet we're seeing the opposite. Additionally, what tax increases are being applied to corporate properties to ensure they are contributing fairly to the community? And taxes will always come up at these meetings, so I'm glad this one was, was front and center and we'll talk about it. Um, as I started with in my opening, this is an ongoing thing. Every year, the, the budget process takes almost a full year. We work right the way through, and we have the same pressures as everybody else. This year, our budget increase was, I think, 7.59%. Now, that's 7.59% of 32.5%, because the Ajax budget is only 32.5% of all of your property taxes. So for every $1,000 in property taxes you pay, 325 comes to the town of Ajax. So 7.59% of that 32.5%, and I know it's complicated, but that relates to 2.4% overall. So our budget impacted your property taxes by 2.47% overall. So I see a lot of things on social media, I hear a lot of things, that's the real number. And it's available on our town website. Um, person that gave the delegation on Monday said we need to keep it under 3%. And I explained, we did keep it under 3%. Now, inflation that you see on the news, for instance, was 2.99% yesterday, isn't reflective of, that's the CPI. That's a, a basket of goods. We deal with the MPI, because municipalities, we're not buying groceries. We're not buying a lot of those things that are calculated in CPI, so we use the MPI, which is about the same but that, that's sort of our, our reference. And as I tried to explain to, to people, to just pick an arbitrary number is not something that we can do because we don't even start at zero each year. We are in a union environment, so there's collective agreements. Last year we hired 20 new firefighters. When you annual, annualize those out, we're generally starting at about 2.5%. So to, to just say we're gonna cap it at that would mean the only other option we could do would be to actually cut services. So, I mean, we can do that, but I ask the people that say to me, you need to do this, okay, what services would you cut? Because we have done studies, we do a, uh, a budget, um, it's on our IMO site, and, and we ask for feedback, and one of the questions we ask is just that, what would you do? And every single time we do this, I think it's like 70 or 80% say they would rather have a user fee or a slight increase than to cut services. And that's what the residents tell us. So that's, that's the way I kind of operate the budget. As far as the corporate side of things, uh, corporations actually pay quite a lot more than residential, and they don't get any services. They still have to pay for their garbage pickup, they still have to pay for their snow removal, they still have to pay for all these things, but they actually pay a much higher percent in corporate taxes. So I'm not gonna be trying to increase that and driving businesses away, because we need businesses as well and we need employment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Was there any follow-ups on, on budgets and on the taxation side of things? Yes, go ahead. I just noticed, I believe it was uh, Monday or Monday night. Sorry, I'm just going to give you this for a bit real quick. Hi. Um, that Whitby was passing a two-year budget. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, because they say it cuts down on costs and town resources, staff resources. So I'm just wondering what you think about that and would be something that you would consider in the future. Not something I would consider. As, as a practicing accountant before I was a counselor and then mayor, um, I understand budgets and, and I don't know how they do that because I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know, I, can, I have enough trouble forecasting for this year, let alone two years from now. We, nobody could have ever forecast COVID for instance and what happened and what came out of that. So they've done that and, and I wish them well. However, they may be tying their hands the next budget year because if things change, we've found, uh, especially in our capital budget, so a road that we forecast a few years ago that might have been a million dollars is now $2 million, 
right? And so our, our capital, we, we budgeted how much goes into the capital budget, but because prices are so much higher than anybody estimated, what we were putting wasn't enough. And now we have to, and that's again part of the, part of the tax increase, is we have to increase the amounts to be able to maintain going forward. So I, I see that multi-year budgets as something that could backfire. It wouldn't be something I would recommend. Um, just, just because, I, again, you can't predict. You can't predict. Uh, anything further on? Yes, sir. Yeah, your uh, slide showed that you wanted to be fair to the taxpayers in your budget. Uh, and nowhere in the budget did I see anything that mentioned charities. And yet we give uh, a 40% tax rebate to charities in Ajax, and almost all of them are religious groups. And I'm not sure that it's fair to have me, I'm not religious, so why am I giving a rebate to a religious group that I don't subscribe to? And uh, we're now giving our grant specialist uh, permission or you know, whatever to go and work for charities or not-for-profit not organizations, so that's more resources. Your own mayor's gala uh, picks a charity and we use Ajax resources to that. So that doesn't seem fair to me. Okay, I'll, that you're I'll try to address charities that. and supporting charities that I don't subscribe to. We we don't give any money to charities. What we have, wait, wait. What we have. Well, is, excuse me, Mayor. Uh, I asked that same question, mm -hmm. and we sign checks that are given to charities, thirteen different charities, and they're all religious groups, and they get a check uh, from Ajax. Let me let me explain. So. Part of the first question that I didn't get to was actually they asked about the casino keeping property taxes low, and this ties into that. So we take a small percentage of the revenues we get from Ajax Downs, which is going down every year, by the way. We, put, we would put that into our capital budget, but we've always kept a portion of that for what we used to call impact Ajax, and I think it was about $100,000. And we took 100000 of the, I think it was about three or $4 million we used to receive and put that into this impact Ajax where community groups could apply for different programming, different things they wanted to do, putting on community events, those types of things. And if they're successful, they could get, and they were, they were in, in anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000 that they put in that. So we've revamped that now. We don't call it the impact Ajax anymore. We call it the Ajax Partnership Fund. And it's a similar thing, and it's just to try and take some of that money from the casino revenues. They're not property tax revenues, they are casino revenues, but to be fair, there's only one taxpayer and we could use those. So it does have a potential tax impact, very minor. But it's to promote community, to promote these events, to get people out, to get people involved. I agree, not religious also. Um, we can't vet... Because it, it's a separate, it's a separate item. It, it's it's. A tax rebate should be in the budget. Well, it's not a rebate. It, it's a it's a partnership. Mr. Mayor, we, we, I do have some additional information. Yeah, Hi there. Um, so the the town does have a program uh, where we do give a forty percent rebate uh, to charitable organizations. They must occupy a commercial or industrial property to qualify for that. In the 2023 year, we did have 13 charitable organization uh, tax rebate applications for that 40% property tax rebate, and that is charged back to the region and the province accordingly. So that is a program that, that we offer within the town, within our, our tax incentives. I thought you were referring to the partnership fund and the things we're putting out. You're talking about an actual tax rebate, property tax rebate? Property tax rebate for charitable organization registered charitable organizations it's funded by the province and the region that occupy a commercial or industrial property it's funded by the region and the province, right. okay. by the region and the province and not by the town i thought you were speaking of another thing i apologize so so based on that 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 is not coming from ajax taxpayers yeah okay okay well this is a program <clears throat> that i don't know a lot about but, um, but I'm glad to hear that it is funded from the province and from the region and not from our tax base. To the other question, to the casino revenues, um, and the first part about keeping it low, it has been. Since that casino opened in 2005, the revenues that have come from there have 
basically meant that we have not had to increase taxes by 1% per year. So if we went up 4% in one year, it would have been five without those revenues. So it has offset um, approximately 1% per year for the last 19 years to that. There was part two of your question. You asked about the, the charities and then you asked about... That's a different thing. Okay, okay. Anything further on, on property taxes? I think there's one over here. Yes, sir. Uh, in your budget process, do you benchmark other municipalities' costs and services versus yours? The, the, what's behind that is I have a property of the same value in, in the city of Toronto, and I pay $2,000 more in tax in the town of Ajax for, for that property. Uh, the first part of your question, yes, we absolutely do look at what all the other municipalities in the region of Durham are charging and what their targets are. Our treasurers meet and they do have those discussions. Um, to your other part of your question, Toronto is a completely different animal. Toronto receives, a, well, first of all, they have much, much, much higher density. So they're able to split the pie up a lot more, making the pieces smaller. We can't compare Toronto taxes to, to Ajax or Durham taxes. It just will never work. They also receive enormous amounts of subsidies from the province and the federal government that the rest of us just do not get. I chair the police board. That's one of the big pieces. They get a ton of money for policing that we just don't get, nobody else does. So I would love to get some of those subsidies from the federal provincial government, um, but until we do, there's always gonna be that discrepancy. It's density and, and it's, it's alternate revenues. They also have other different revenue streams. We only have property taxes. They have their own land transfer tax. They have a number of other revenue streams that we don't have that assist with that. Yes, sir. This is actually uh, this is actually more of a budgeting question, but uh, my question is for uh, the fiscal year 2024. What would be the town of Ajax budget for allocation of support for homeless people in this town? Uh, our costs were approximately $500,000 this year, or last year, sorry. We don't have an actual budget allocation for that. We just absorb it into our current budget because those social programs are regional. So the region, the region of Durham collects 54%. I think we're 32 and a half percent. They're 54% of what you pay in taxes. And that's out of their budget. That being said, that does not cover the things that we need. Like across the road, we have a major problem in the plaza. We need to have private security. We need to, we need to clean up. I mean, the region's not gonna come and clean up some of the messes we have over there. And the residents aren't gonna tolerate it staying like that. So we have to pay to clean it up, we end up absorbing those. And our cost to the taxpayers last year was about half a million dollars. There is a program going forward that the region is now saying they will fund some of these things. They won't fund private security yet. I'm still arguing with them about that because that's our biggest piece. If you look at our library statistics, our library tracks the incidents they have and they have a lot of overdoses, a lot of things that happen right next door at our main branch. That has gone up I think it's in the neighborhood of five or six hundred percent in the last three years. It's it's significant, and and we have to address it. So, we don't actually budget for it, but we do absorb it in our current budgets, in in operating and in in um, uh, our, our maintenance and, and those other things. So Oshawa, okay, so, right, I'm not talking about the region. The region pays a million dollars a month of our tax dollars to, to house the homeless and to house the um, asylum seekers that are here under federal programs. Um, this past summer, we, last, last summer, we had major, major problem. We had something like 600 uh, refugees slash asylum seekers come here from Toronto. So the federal government is bringing people in um, I'm no problem with immigration, and they're supposed to be funding them for a year through certain programs and through certain organizations. In Toronto, it just wasn't happening. These people were living on the streets, it was very unsafe, and we found out they were being, not bust, but banned here, because Ajax was nice and safe, and they're like, come to Ajax, they'll feed you, they'll clothe you, they'll, and, and they were. And, and the region had, to, we had last summer, in all the Durham College, um, Housing was taken up with, with asylum seekers, refugees, asylum seekers for the summer because we had to put them somewhere. They couldn't be on the street. Our, our homeless count in Ajax in one day went up 
because when they close the shelter across the road at, at five o'clock and there's no, there's no beds for these people, they just are on the street. So we have to do something. And you'll, you'll, you'll tell, I mean, they, they, you know, the, normally when you see some, somebody who's unhomed, they might have a shopping cart or something, but when you see the people with the suitcases, they're, they're the refugees. They're the ones that have come here through the government programs and are on the streets because there's nothing for them. So that's what they're referring to. That's a million dollars a month the region pays. And there is supposed to be funding, and I reached out to her MP last year, and I said, Mark, you know, you've got to do something about this. And they came up with $200 million of unbudgeted funding to help address this big refugee crisis we were having. They immediately gave $90 million to Toronto, who wasn't doing the job to begin with. That's why they're coming here. They gave $40 million to um, Hamilton, and the rest of us had to apply through a program to try and get the money. So the year before, when we had all the Ukrainian and, was it Syria, the refugees here, we applied and we got turned down. Now we've applied again for all of the people that are coming here from places like um, Somalia, Nigeria, those places, that's where a lot of them are coming from now, and we're still waiting. Meanwhile, they give Toronto 90 million, they give Hamilton 90 million. I'm the one that was asking for him. he's RMP. <laughs> so it's, it's a struggle, it's, a, it's, it's um, frustrating because we're dealing with it on the ground and we have to apply for these programs and we're not getting the funding. So it's falling on the backs of taxpayers. Yeah. That's, I, I wouldn't disagree with that number. No, I wasn't there, no, no, no. Uh, but I wouldn't disagree with that number. It, it's growing, Ajax is, Oshawa is clearly number one. Ajax is number two in the region, easily. Yeah, and, and I, I know where they are. <laughs> I know where they are. I, I spend a lot of time driving around and, and seeing what's going on in this town. I, I'm well aware um, the, the issue is it's not illegal to be homeless. And, um, you know, it, it's, there's processes that ha we have to go through. We can't just, if somebody's camped on a median, go and yank them off and take their stuff and kick them out. We have to go through a certain process. We have regional people that come out. We have to offer them the services. We have to find them shelter. We have to do a lot of things before we can take any type of action. And by comparison, the situation has almost none. Yeah. Almost zero. Well, they say for every one you see, there's, I think, 20 you don't see. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I know, I know. I just realized I neglected to introduce some of my councillors here. I saw the regional council, Marilyn Crawford, come in. Um, she's back there. And local councillor Nancy Henry is here as well. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Yes. Um, speaking of homeless people, um, obviously the plaza across the road, where probably many people have noticed it, how do you plan to address that issue with the homeless? Because there's businesses on that whole plaza, like my doctor's office, that are losing businesses because people don't want to be around there no more because it's unsafe. So how do you plan to put that into the budget to keep those businesses and maybe help these people on the streets? What's the plan in the budget for that? Okay, and, and as I was saying, that's, it's not in the budget, but we do pay it. Um, the region now has a new program that we are applying for funding because they did give money to Oshawa and they did, did give money to Whitby. And I said, that's completely unfair. I supported them both in votes to get it, but I said, you need to have something that's fair for all municipalities in the region. Like, we're number two, clearly number two. Um, the issues across the street, quite honestly, the best thing we can do for that entire area is redevelop it. Unfortunately, we had a plan to do that almost 10 years ago, and it's been sidetracked for the last six, stuck in the courts. We're very, very close to the conclusion of that now. Well, that we owned the parking lot area, and we sold it to a developer, and it was supposed to be a development called Central Park, Lamine Group. Um, for whatever reasons, we, that ended up in the courts. The decision making has been out of our hands for the last six years. It's in receivership now. I understand we're very close. I can't really talk too much about that, because that's in camera. But um, ultimately, I think that's the best thing that we can do for that area, is to redevelop it. In the meantime, we're doing, as I said, hiring private security, cleaning up, trying to maintain the appearance and dealing with the issues. We have an agreement now with Durham Regional Police where we have um, 
two officers on bicycles that are generally patrolling in that area. They have an office in that office space, used to be the G Center, now it's the something hub, um, where they, they work out of. So just that presence alone is enough to, I was, is enough to sort of stop some of those issues. Um, I was behind there today in, in the back of the building and I saw three police cruisers there dealing with, with something. I didn't get involved, I just kind of drove by. But the presence is there because it is needed and there's nothing we can technically really do about it. As I said, it's not illegal to be homeless, but we're dealing with some of the, um, some of the issues that are coming out of that, like the garbage, like the, the vandalism, like some of the drug paraphernalia, like the security to the businesses, like people asking for money and accosting people that are going into the businesses. I, I understand, my, my accounting firm used to be across there. I, I wouldn't have wanted to have to deal with that. Um, but, but we're doing our best, but we're not actually budgeting for it. We are, we are paying for it and going out to the region for reimbursement, hopefully. Yes? I would like to know if we can help the homeless out, even if they're on the streets or laying on the sidewalks, even passing them too. What can we do to help them? Um, that's a very good question. The one I don't have an answer for. You're, you're free to, to offer and do whatever it is you would like to do, whether it's give them food, money, clothing, whatever. Um, what I found is there's, like, we offer a lot of services through the region. There are services available for treatment, for um, help finding a job, for help finding um, somewhere to live. There is a percentage of the population that just want to be homeless. They just want to be left alone and do their thing. And I don't have a problem with them. Just don't set up on Harwood Avenue, because now I have to do something about it. Right? We have to get people involved if that's the case. But there are a percentage that just don't want help, they just want to do their thing. But yeah, people are free to, to do whatever it is you would like to do. If you want to buy them a meal, if you want to do whatever it is, great. I think I saw someone you here, or? Uh, just on the Brendan. plaza across the street, um, that problem is spilling into the, into the plaza to the south where the yep. Tim Hortons is. Not, not to the level it is across the street, but across the street, what, what's the property owner are they being, um, are their feet being held to the fire to do something with that property? Just, I don't know, a coat of paint or, or, or something? Which, which one are you talking about? The, 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 Har the plaza across Harwood. Okay, like the, where the, what was it, Sal's grocery store in, in that section or the one further down where the good light? No, the one just directly across the street. Directly across? Well, that's a very unique, um, and as I said, my office used to be over there. That's a very unique property. I think it might be the only one like it in the province. It, it was a plaza with 27 different owners when I was there. And trying to, I was on the BIA before I was even on council, trying to get something done to beautify the area because when you're dealing with clients coming in and it's a bit of a kind of rundown plaza, which it has become over the last 50, 60 years, um, it was like, honestly, herding cats trying to get the 27 owners together to do anything, to try to do any kind of uniform facade improvements or anything to try and improve the area. It just was a real challenge. And I, I think, from my time on the BIA there, it is the only, it's a very unique situation having a plaza like that with individual owners. Usually that entire plaza, like the, the one next down here um, where the Tim Hortons is, and the one, the Rio, um, not Rio Cam, what is it? Fine, finally, who owns the one, Steve Reddy? What, the Rex one? Anyway, back, back where back where Wires and LCBO is, they're all owned by one company, right. right? So that makes it a lot easier to deal with these things, but having like across the road owned by all these different ones makes it a real challenge because, you know, they can own it, but we can't make them do anything. So are the feet being held with fire? No, no. Um, Catherine. Thanks, Mayor Collier. I understand full well how difficult it is to generate new revenue streams in a town like Ajax. So I'd like to refer back to, I think it was February Council's meeting, and Council voted for a community benefit charge to charge developers 4%, I think it was, and it passed, it and I thought, pass. oh, this is, well, it did pass at Council, and as I understand it, you Vetoed executed it. a veto yeah. against it. So I would just sort of like clarification as to why you decided a veto 
should happen when council voted yeah. for it. Thank you. That's fine. And, and actually, I think that might be the only veto that's happened in the province. <laughs> so it's a bit unique. Um, that, so the community benefit charge is going to come back in September. Okay, it was never gone forever. It was, it was referred, really, because there was some information that we're trying to get. I fundamentally have a problem charging a fee, especially in this environment, in this cost environment of unaffordability and housing shortage, charging a fee on a development that's going to get passed on to the tenant to put into a pool to use to benefit other people that's never going to benefit these people. I just fundamentally, there's enough fees involved, whether it's cash in lieu of parkland, whether it's all these other things that get added onto development. And the planning process takes the, the um, groundbreaking we did today at 310 Kingston Road was 10 years in the making. Okay, That's 10 years of the owners carrying the property, paying the taxes, paying all the planning fees, doing everything else. It's in the tens of millions of dollars added onto the project, project cost. So when we come out with a community benefit charge, it's the same thing. It's, it's just another cost. And now what's happening is, and I, I called this three years ago, unfortunately, I said, you know, we need to get these developments approved and get shovels in the ground now, because what's going to happen? I could see interest rates going up. I knew they were going to go up. I, I mean, I, I worked in finance for, for 20 years before. I mean, I knew they were going to go up. I could see, we knew the supply chain issues we had during COVID, we knew how much costs had gone up. We know that it's hard to get labor now. I don't know where the workers went during COVID, but they've gone somewhere. There's a real shortage of getting skilled labor to do these things. All that increases the price. And there's a point where the business plans that made sense three years ago when they applied for these projects worked, and now they don't work. And what we're seeing today is all the incentives that the provincial government and the federal government have been giving, like um, DC reductions on, on purpose-built rentals, like the eight, waiving of the HST, like a number of CMHC financing. All these things are geared towards rental housing. And I also said, you know, we're going to end up with nothing but rental housing and no condos. And that's what's happening now. The condo market is completely dried up. There are no people pre-purchasing -pre condos. So developers aren't building. They're all coming back to me now and converting their developments from condo developments to um, rental. And, and so back to the original question, now to add a community benefit charge on top of these things that I'm seeing, and it's not just one developer, it's all of them. And banks have stopped giving financing on a lot of things again because interest rates are high and they're waiting for interest rates to come down. I just finished saying the results yesterday or two days ago came out, inflation is up. The cost of goods in, in Ontario went up 10% for groceries in the last month. I mean. The Bank of Canada is not going to be cutting interest rates again anytime soon. That quarter percent is all we're going to see for the rest of this year, in my prediction. So that's why I didn't support the community benefit charge there. Also, there's this thing we call POPs. It's, it's the private-owned public spaces. So when somebody is doing a development, they're required to provide some parkland, out, so outdoor amenity space. If the property is too small, then they have to pay what's called cash in lieu of parkland, which is basically a community benefit charge. And that money goes into a pool, and we use that to build a park somewhere else, where these people, they're going to pay the, the fee, but they may never use the park. The POPs, so that the park is a public place. The POPs are, so if they're building one of these buildings, like across the road here, they have all this outdoor amenity space, rooftop patios, dog, dog stations, all these other things. There's no provision. Those are what we call the POPs, the private outdoor public spaces, versus a park, which is a public outdoor space. We're waiting to hear some information back from the province on whether those POPs, the private spaces, which are only, I guess, for the residents' use, can be calculated towards the parkland requirement. And we didn't have that information yet, and we still don't have that information. And so I was reluctant to bring in a community benefit charge we had that information as well. So it's coming back. I've committed to council to bring in this. Respectfully, I know you don't want a yeah but, and I will give you a yeah but. Yeah, yeah, but. Because no, because you just introduced me to pop. Okay. So just have me think about how much the pop is going to be for the Never heard to me because you just mentioned pop, so I'm glad I'm here. So where did that money go? We use 
money for replanting all over town. We've also had a number of developments like the Derosha last year, the big storm where we lost a bunch of trees, the ice storm that we had, um, how long ago was that, 15 years ago or so, um, where we lost a ton of trees and we had to go buy all new equipment for, for chippers and all this other stuff. We have used those funds that we collect for, for um, tree removal to replant across the town. We do our, our green initiative days, I think they're called, whatever they are, where we, well, we do cleanups and we clean things. So those do occur. Um, we have the Highway of Heroes thing where, where I think five million trees were planted along the highway. We participated in, there's a lot of different initiatives. That's key to key. Pretty much, it's actually more like 10 to one. So if somebody takes down one, they usually, because they might take down a tree this big, so they might have to plant 10 or 20 smaller ones to, to compensate for that. But yeah, the, those funds do go back in. Our tree canopy in Ajax is one of the most, um, one of the strongest, one of the largest in, in the region of Durham, if not Ontario. So, yeah. There you go, now you learn pop. See, we learned something new today. <laughs> uh, so we got a little bit off taxation. Let's go to the next one. So, uh, oh, okay, well, we're still on taxation. Why did the mayor and council vote to increase spending this year and increase our property tax by over 7%, 7.59, actually? Um, one of the highest tax rates in the province. That's not true. We're on fixing it. Okay, so I think I explained that. I think I explained that. We are 7.59% of 32.5%, which is 2.47. So that was what the tax increase was. Why we did, because that's what it costs to run the town. That's the easy answer. <laughs> We're not making money on it. We're not, we take what it costs to run the town. We have a mill rate, depending on the value of your property, it's fair market value assessment, which is done by MPAC, which is not done by us. MPAC does a value of every home. They say, this is what the house is worth. There's a multiplier, that's how much tax you pay. And that's how we determine. Here's a cycling one. I love to ride into my errands via bicycle. Will there soon be a continuous bike lane which could safely take me from north to south Ajax, specifically over the 401? Um, I talked about the, in one of my slides, the lower Harwood and from Veterans Point Gardens up to Pat Bailey, up to Bailey, which is almost halfway. Unfortunately, all the roads across the 401, we got, we got Westney, Harwood, Salem, Lake Ridge, are all um, MTO bridges, basically, and they're all pinch points. So to add cycling infrastructure to, for instance, the bridge right here over the 401 is impossible. So even though we would like to, um, it's going to be very, very difficult to do that. We are constantly working with the province and the region to, to try and address these pinch points. But with MTO, a bridge could be, I don't know, 20 million easy, and, and they're not going to build a $20 million bridge just for a cycle path. It, it makes it a real challenge. So we are working on it. Our cycle infrastructure, I think we've got over 120 kilometers of paved trails in Ajax. I know Uxbridge calls themselves the trail capital of Canada, but really we are. We, we, and, um, but these pinch points are a challenge that we're not going to be able to overcome anytime soon. Any questions on cycling? Yes? How much did, um, since you opened the casino in Pickering, how much did it affect the revenues in Ajax through the Ajax casino? Significantly, not quite half right now, but it is continuing to decline. So we used to get, I, I'm not sure if at our peak we were getting around six million, seems to resonate with me, I'm not sure. I think now we're about three and a half to four. So it, it but it is continuing to go down. And it's very frustrating because um, back in, when was it, about 2012, I think, I, I was presented with a business plan from the operators here, from the PCOPs, about creating a, um, uh, what did they call it, a, a cultural node or something, and it, it involved, and it, it was, it involved have, uh, adding table games and, and a concert venue and a number of things to the area here. Um, but it also required, part of that was converting some of the lands for retail use. And it just didn't go anywhere. So it, it's unfortunate because had that conversation gone a little bit differently, Durham Live would not exist. We fought that fight very hard. We lost. Um, it is what it is at this point. Did it affect you? Oh yeah, it, it's cost us significantly, yeah. We, we still, I think we've received over the last 19 years almost $100 million in revenue from that casino. But it's kind of gone like this and now it's 
on the way down again. So we're, we're having to come up with other um, non-tax revenues. One of the things we're looking at is naming rights for some of our buildings, like the fairgrounds, for instance. That's a no-brainer to me. Uh, you know, some big corporation wants to come and pay, I don't know, a million dollars a year to have their name on that. I'm taking that because that's non-tax revenue. That's money I don't have to go back to the taxpayer for. What, what does Sterling Ellis say? The, the Doritos Community Center over here or something? I'm like, sure, if, if, the, if the price is right, because then we don't have to come back to the taxpayers for that revenue. There's another one we just talked about today. I was doing an interview um, with the board, about the Board of Trade, and we talked about a lot of municipalities have a, a visitor's tax that's assessed on hotel stays. And I travel a lot, and I pay that all, all the time all over the world. I never really thought about it. But if we can do that and use that for tourism and to assist businesses, that's non-tax revenue. Right? That was part of the problem during COVID. Businesses were coming to us saying, how can you help us wanting financial help? And I said, well, I, I can help put you in touch with the people for the federal and provincial programs that are happening. We can help uh, create a business network so people can find your business, you know what they're offering during COVID. And we changed our planning process to allow um, permits for patios, so restaurants could have outdoor space very easily, but we couldn't give them money to support their business, right? Where here, if we were to initiate something like this visitor's levy or whatever it's called, it would give us a pool of money to start helping assisting businesses and promote tourism and do those types of things. So it's something I'm looking into. I'm always looking for non-tax revenue. Another thing we initiated that was non-tax revenue that a lot of other municipalities were doing and we were leaving money on the table was, if there's an accident, on the 401, and our, police, our fire department responds, we bill that fee back to the province. But there's a provision in everybody's insurance policy on your car where we can bill that fee back. So it costs us to, then the fire department is a third of our budget. It's a big piece of our, of our operating budget at the town of Ajax. We can bill that back to insurance companies. So we brought, maybe five years ago, a change which now, if you're for non-residents, so if you are a non-resident of Ajax and you are at an at-fault accident, we bill that cost back to their insurance company. So Ajax taxpayers aren't paying that fee. Maybe. <laughs> but it, but it, the residents of Ajax aren't paying for it. If I live in Whitby, it wouldn't affect me. I mean, I'm not a resident of Ajax, but it still would affect me. I'm always in Ajax, so I live in Whitby. It would, maybe. <laughs> but you were at-fault accident. It's, it, it's similar to during COVID when we had all the part, like everybody loves our waterfront, great, it's beautiful. It, it's, it's like the crown jewel. But we had so many people going there from outside of Ajax and absolutely welcome. However, our costs for, for litter pickup, for security, for maintenance, for everything went tripled. And I wasn't gonna pass that fee on to Ajax taxpayers. Like we're the, also the only place where there's free parking. So that's why we now have that parking system down by the lake for non-residents. If you want to come use our waterfront, great, but you're going to pay your share, so I'm not passing that fee on to Ajax taxpayers. So I, I've tried to do those things. Those are non-tax revenue streams. Yes? That's exactly what I was going to mention to you. Okay. About parking down at the lakefront. Since COVID, it is now busy all the time. Thrilled to see it. And a lot of the people I see from the daily basis are visitors. So. Why aren't we charging seven days a week instead of just the weekend? It would increase our revenue, and we could be even as high as Pickering is and allow their seniors to come over and not pay for parking. I can park for free in Pickering, right? You just have to go and apply. But there's no reason why visitors from out of town, busloads of visitors from out of town, shouldn't have to pay for parking seven days a week, just like Pickering. We should model our neighbors. Well, actually, Pickering copied our program. So they, they, they <laughs> that's, for seven days. that's the ultimate sign, and that's the ultimate compliment. When they copy our program, I'm like, okay, we're doing something right, because Pickering and I don't get along that well. So um, to what you're saying, we, again, I want to encourage people to come use, I want people to come to Ajax. There's other benefits, like they come and they eat in our restaurants, and they might shop at the stores and things like that. So we don't want to have it as a deterrent, but I did want to make sure that our costs are covered. And so maybe that's why we're not quite as stringent as some of the others in charging every day. I think we are only charging the peak times. We're charged that six o'clock. Well, I can, cer I can certainly, 
I can look at it, I can consider it. Or somebody's gonna write that down over there. We can consider that for the next budget. Yeah, okay, okay. I, I always try and balance, that's the thing, right? The other thing we did was, um, because charging along the waterfront, people the other streets, so, so we, we expanded it to there and we also made one side of the road no parking and the other side parking, I think we rotate that. So it's been, it's been a, this is our second, this will be our third full year, I think. Last year we made some, some minor changes so instead of paying $20 for a whole day, which is still cheap, if you go to Barrie, I think it's 60. So 20 is still cheap, but we now have a half day for 10, I think. So we, we have made some changes. And if you are a resident and, and you have no parking in front of your house or whatever, uh, you can apply for it, and you're having guests for the weekend or something, there is a residential parking thing you can apply to so your guests can stay and park on the street and you're not gonna get tickets. Okay, another interesting, All right. another interesting um, meeting this week. I'm down at 7 a.m. and I'm walking the waterfront and there's four major tents pitched. Um, they're fish at the kayak launch with barbecues going. Nice group of guys. And I said, you know, if bylaw comes down, they're not going to like you being here doing this. And they were very polite. But for some, we need to have, I know we have a crew that, um, a security crew that drives through, and I'm not sure if they're driving through in the evening now. Yep. Um, but I think we need somebody to do that before we start to have everybody coming down and pitching tents and not understanding the rules because you can easily drive in and do so. Well, I, and, and I think you know how to reach our bylaw department. So if there is, let us know. If you see something, we can't be everywhere all the time. So if you do see a problem, let us know. And we'll definitely be there. But yeah, we do have our security people, but they generally operate evenings and overnight. They're not as much during the days. So, but then we have our regular parks people out during the days. But if you do see something, please let me know and let your counselor know and we'll, we'll get people on it. Um, next one was overgrown trees on boulevards. So what's the plan to deal with overgrown trees on boulevards that belong to the town? Well, they all belong to the town, everything on, on the road side of the sidewalk. In the fall, winter months, they block out street lights. Okay, so we have um, a, a tree block pruning program. We, it's a contracted service, and we have that, and we do entire streets at a time. If you do see an area where the trees are, sometimes you're walking and they're hanging down and hitting you when you're walking, let us know, and we'll get, we'll get our arborists out there, and we'll have a look, and we'll... we'll um, do that clearing for you. It's usually the, our pruning service is usually completed in the fall and winter months by a contracted service. Um, Mr. Baker, I think you're here? Yep. Yeah, so on lodging houses from, so I, I remember this and you've, you've sent me a lot of stuff over the years. So um, we, we in 2013 initiated a lodging house bylaw, like a rooming house bylaw because we had a couple of instances where people would, you know, rent their house out to six, eight, like six, eight rooms. Everybody has a bedroom, and and we found that there wasn't always the fire, um, like things like like uh, smoke detectors, and some of the safety issues weren't being adhered to, and there were some safety things. So we brought forward this this lodging house bylaw. So your questions were. Has there been any subsequent reports? Yes, um, I, did, I did have some information here from staff that, yes. So we, look, so we had our housing strategy, went to council three times, phase one, phase two, and the final housing action plan. The last one was dealt with on June 5th, 2023 at the CAP meeting, action number 18. And then part of our strat plan, action number 18, is to review the lodging house bylaw over the medium term, which will be between 2027 and 2029. So we will be reviewing that bylaw. It's been in place for 11 years. Your next question is how many people are using it? Um, we, we currently only have one over the years and they stopped using it after five years. They, they voluntarily stopped using, they stopped using their house as a rooming house. A lodging house is if you, if you have a property and you just open it up so you can rent a bedroom, rent a room. So you could have four, five, six people living in one house who are not related, who are just sharing a kitchen, but each have a, each have a bedroom and share a bathroom, that type of thing. So it's kind of, well, there was one, there isn't anymore. 
but well, again, we have we have a bylaw because we want to make sure if somebody's going to operate that, fine. But we need to make sure again you you are adhering to the proper things. You have proper um, egress so people can get out in the case of a fire. You have the proper smoke detectors. You're you're falling, so we want to do the inspection, make sure it's safe, and make sure. Yeah. So there was only one one licensed lodging house over the years, and after five years, they stopped. So now uh, we don't have Mayor any. Mayor can I just add to yeah, what you just ahead. said? Uh, first of all, I'm a landlord, and I run rooming houses, and you know that. And I've been the largest provider of affordable housing in Durham Region that is not either government or charitably funded, and that comes right from uh, Durham Region Housing. So I, I, I'm an expert in this field. Although I am selling my properties, and there's a lot of them that are not able to find other places to live. But of the one rooming house that was licensed, that was actually a fraud. But okay. that wasn't uh, you. You've it, not ever got a license. I cannot, there's never been, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, there's never been, other than this one, a lodging house license issued by the town of Ajax. Right now, there, I'll even answer my right second question. Right now, there's question. none. There are none. Right. There was one, and I say that that was a fraud, and excuse me for getting a little excited, because I am excited about this problem we have. And that was actually put in uh, as a license because the property was actually a group home. Yep. And there That's were more distant separations between group homes at that time. And the same people, the one that was closest to it. And as soon as that minimum distance was dropped, town of Ajax, under pressure from the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Okay, that's what I found out. Uh, that's when they dropped the license for a lodging house because it wasn't needed anymore. It was really a group home right from the beginning. And it, I, I, I checked that out personally myself the very day that that license was issued. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, I can write a book on that story. So we've, we've had one. It only lasted until the mm -hmm. minimum distance separation was ended. And even to this day, right now, still so well, my, my questions go on beyond that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm that. getting them, but I, I didn't answer your questions. Um, several of the properties, including your own, have chosen not to complete the requirements of the Ontario Building Code to meet the minimum requirements of the code. This is not an option the town can waive as it's a mandatory under law. So since 2009, we, 2019, we've investigated 59 complaints regarding lodging houses. Many of the complaints were not valid as they did not meet the criteria of a lodging house or a group home. Some were in a zone not permitted, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, we, we do have our bylaw. We adhere to our bylaw. It's not something that, that has been a complaint that I get. I've never received a complaint about a lodging home or a, a group home or whatever you want to call it. We have done this, and we've gone through the proper process, and it's just something that's not used. So I think I answered your questions, which was, what are the reports? How many have been issued? How many are currently in effect? How many have not been approved? None. One rescind not rescinded, one voluntary rescinded. And how many have been closed by the town? N um, none. So I've answered, I've answered those questions. I have a license. Okay. Okay. And it's not possible to get a license. A house that was built in 1950. And all of my houses are 1950s houses in the older part of Ajax. Cannot possibly conform to today's building code. Cannot do it. And for that reason, there's no license available. Okay. So I have to operate illegally. Well, I sir, we... I am really operating illegally. Okay. I, 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 I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to know. Because I'm the only guy in this city that this town is doing it. And, and, and you know what, we, we have a lot of complaints, sir, and we have to respond to those complaints when they come up about sometimes, I'm sure you're a good operator, and, but some are not. So when you get these and you get parties, and you, we, it's a problem that we have to investigate, which is why we have the bylaw, which is why we have all bylaws. Bylaws are a result of a problem that we've had to, to somehow try and solve and regulate. And, and everything, whether it's outdoor burning in your backyard, whether it's you know, I'd love to have people to be able to have a little campfire in their backyard, but you get some guy that builds a thing this big out of leaves and lights it on fire and has a hot dog and says it's a cooking fire. Like, that's why we need bylaws, because sometimes people push things to the ridiculous, right? And I'm not exaggerating. This happens. I can't write this. So, so we, ha we have to have it for safety. Uh, it's unfortunate that, that 
you're in that situation, but, but I mean, it, it is, we're, we are, we have to follow the building code, and that's what the building code says. Whether it's basement apartments, whether it's, you know, these new nanny suites that we can have, whether it's fourplexes as of right, all these things, we have to follow the planning code. Yes? No, no, we're, we're going to move on, because we've, you, you, I've, I've had this discussion with you many times over the last 11 years. Yes? Um, so I just wanted to understand exactly what the definition of a lodging house is. So for example, on my street, there is one house. The owner does not live at the house. I'm going, he, I would say he rents the rooms. I think it's to students because they all seem to be about the same age. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure there's one kitchen. Well, there always was one kitchen. So is that considered a I lodge? Would, I would think yes, but I don't know the definition. I can certainly get you the definition. I'm sure it's available on our site. We can get it and send it to you. Um, I would assume so. I, I think that's probably one of the requirements. The owner doesn't live there, that it's multiple. Um, I mean, if each bedroom has a lock, its own individual lock, it's obviously seven. Uh, there's a number of things. I don't know what they are off the top of my head. But yeah, uh, I can guarantee, though, knowing what staff have told me here, it is not licensed or regulated if it is. Yeah, so before I go back, because, Kathy, you've had a few. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, forgive my ignorance. Is that wrong? To rent your apartment, your own house rent to some students? Uh, no, it's not wrong as long as you follow the criteria and the, the safety things are in place. So, so if there's a fire, if there's something, people can if get out. If the fire and everything is by standard, by code, yep. so it's okay yeah. if anybody from it, their own fine. house rents. It's yeah. okay. uh, So we have, we have a process and we have an inspection process and we have things that have to be met. And if they are, yeah, it's fine. Yep. Yes, Kathy, you were... I was going to get to that, and, and no, there isn't. No, there isn't. And because it's not an issue that we get many of, I think Councillor Henry brought one forward in, in that war. But again, one out of 36,000 homes to me isn't something that we really, that would constitute a problem. So Airbnb itself, and I, I attend a lot of different things as, as my role in the police board and as my role as, as council and mayor going to AMO, FCM, these other things. Um, they, uh, we learn about a lot of these things. And Airbnb themselves have made changes to the way they do business, recognizing that people are renting these party houses and holding these massive rave parties that, that you know, cause all kinds of problems, and then the people just leave. So they've now got a lot of things in where people just can't do that anymore, which has really helped solve a lot of the problems. I know there was one area, it wasn't an Airbnb, it was actually a, a father was living in Toronto and owned the house and his son was there, his 20-something year old son was there and lived there with a bunch of his 20-year-old friends and it was just a, a nightmare. The, the sound and the, the things that were happening and the burnouts on the streets and the garbage everywhere. Again, that doesn't fit into either one of the categories we just talked about. That's just bad neighbors. And again, those are all difficult things to deal with. What are the inside neighbors? Okay. <laughs> It's not one that I would want to entertain because I think the complaints would far outweigh any revenue we would get from that. And, and in your case, if you have somebody that's parking trailers, um, those are not allowed. Like we don't, you can't keep your camper parked in your driveway all year round. We allow it in the summer, but then it has to go somewhere else in the winter, just like your boat, right? So if you have a boat, you, you can have it in the summer. It's, it's technically not allowed according to our bylaw, but we don't enforce it unless it's a complaint but you can't keep it there all year round. So uh, same with school buses, same with large trucks. You know, we have a lot of people who, um, you know, somebody who's a general contractor, a handyman that might have a trailer with their tools, right? So we, you can have that, but it can't be one of these massive 20-foot trailers. 
<laughs> that's a commercial unit, right? You, you can't run a landscape company from a home in Ajax, for instance. So if, if your neighbor, you know, being a nuisance, I'll call it, there's remedies for that. We can, we can get you that information. But by the time. Devin, you yep. look like um, you have something. No, no, no. <laughs> um, it was until 8 p.m., but all good if you have anything else you want to talk about or anything? Uh, we, can, we, can do, we can do a couple more, and then yeah. if there is, and then, then wrap it up, yeah. Right, before we leave, you could talk about the concerns raised by the outgoing integrity commissioner. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not unhappy to see them go. I said that at the council meeting on Monday. Somebody pulled the bylaw. I think you FOI'd it, and anyway, I saw it online somewhere. But, um, yeah, it, it's, we, we just didn't see eye to eye on the way things were happening. It's funny enough, um, I'm not going to make it public, but there was a integrity commissioner complaint against me for removing the bike lanes on Harwood that I just got the notification from Principal's Integrity yesterday, and I'm sure we're going to get a bill for it that says, you know, there was no contraventions. It might not be a popular decision, but there was no contraventions. So, but if I didn't make that change to the code of conduct, we never would have even known there was a complaint. We wouldn't have known what the outcome was unless it was found that I did contradict the code of conduct, but we would certainly have gotten a bill. So f for accountability and transparency to the taxpayer, that's not cool to me to have an integrity commissioner that we are required to have through provincial legislation that does their work behind the scenes and does um, mediation and settles things behind the scenes, even, even when there was a contradiction of the code of conduct. I mean, to me that says why have a code of conduct if the integrity commissioner is going to deal with things behind closed doors and dismiss it and send us a bill which we have to pay with tax dollars but we don't know what that was. So the change that we made to the code of conduct was just saying principles integrity, report back to us on the complaints you get who they're against, what they are, what the outcome was. We don't know who filed the complaint, um, but we certainly know what the cost is. Yeah, we won't know who the complainant is. I don't want to know. But, but if somebody files a complaint against me, I, I would like to know what it was and, and what the outcome was. I mean, I'm pretty conscientious of the code of conduct. So Principal's Integrity decided to, to you know, they didn't want to be our Integrity Commissioner anymore, and they resigned. I said, fine, because we don't see eye to eye on this. And I had a meeting with them several months ago and told them this. I'm, we need to have that accountability. We need to have these reportings so we know what's going on. I'm not just writing blank checks to you. And they decided to go, so we've appointed a new integrity commissioner, Erda Burles, and um, I just actually signed the contract with them today. Yeah, there's, it's, it's all public, nothing, nothing behind closed doors on this. It's just they decided that they did not like the way that we were going, and that's their right. Um, I'm not aware of it happening before, but I mean, I, again, I, what they were doing, I found unusual. Yes, it was a very small one line in the Code of Conduct that says they could do that, but there's a lot of other stuff in the Code of Conduct. <laughs> so, anyway, that's, that's that. That's the answer. Any, anything further before we wrap it up? I'm getting the wrap-up sign from, from, from Ms. McClarty here. So, all right, one quick. One yeah. So, um, Yep. Talks about affordable. Uh, yeah, affordable. air quote affordable. Yeah, because we don't really. The problem is going back and forth between affordable and able. Yeah. It depends on yeah. the date. So, um, do we have a definition of what that affordable is going to mean to, to the residents that have The quick answer is no. Um, through the Ontario Big City Mayors, which I'm very involved in, we've ad advocated to the province to give us a definition of what affordable is. Because condo versus like if you're buying something, the developer's not going to build something and sell it for less than they paid for it. Right? As far as I'm concerned, CMHC should be giving mortgages to everybody without question that's going to be building any type of purpose-built rental housing, but there's still an application process and it's pretty onerous and they have to actually pay about a 40,000 fee to apply, which again gets passed on. Affordable, my understanding of the definition is I believe 20% below the average market rent. But then there's also another way the region looks at things when they're fi doing financing or when they're, because they receive provincial subsidies, where it's a percentage of what you make that's subsidized, 
right? So if you make, I don't know, whatever, and you can pay $800 a month, they'll pay the other 400. That's subsidized, right? So there's different, different things, and they all kind of are part of the affordable equation, but technically nobody has ever really said this is what affordable is. And that's, that's part of the issue. What I'm trying to do is, is just get, I, I understand economy of scale. I, want, I don't want to be the mayor at the end of my term that's, that's got all kinds of approvals and nothing built. I want to see a lot of shovels in the ground. I've been using the strong mayor powers and mayor's directives quite a bit to streamline the process. I'll use 310 as an example. They um, had their, their subdivision, their, their um, site plan done. They're ready to go. Because of changes they made in the building to the heating um, and cooling systems, so you know some buildings, we get in trouble with this every year, like the medallion buildings at Papillion Square here, they'll turn off the chillers for the air conditioning in September and turn on the boilers for the heating, and then we'll get a, a hot week in, in October, and everybody's complaining there's no air conditioning, there's only heating, right? Because that converts the whole building. That's the way 310 was. It was set up with that central cooling heating system, so one is on, one is off, and it affects the whole building. They made a change to their HVAC systems, which allows each unit to have its own individual furnace air conditioner, so that each individual unit can control it. It took a little more space. I know, a long story, we're almost wrapped up, Christy. Um, it took away nine parking spots. So instead of them having to go back through a committee of adjustment or go back through a zoning bylaw amendment, which could take months to a year, is the mayor's directive to very easily just change the zoning bylaw. And I've used the mayor's directives maybe 10 times so far, and council has supported them 10 times. So there is still the accountability, but I'm using it to try and streamline these things and get these shovels in the ground as quickly as possible because I, I just, given the markets, I'm concerned that, that we're, everything's going to be put on hold, and that's not good for anybody. So uh, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you for staff for putting this together. And, and all your hard work. There is more food and coffees in the back. Please help yourself. And I'm glad to sort of mingle for 10, 15 more minutes and answer any individual questions. And thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of your evening and have a great long weekend and, uh, and summer if I don't see you before.